on the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. We're talking about a proposal tonight that would dramatically change the packaging for some prescription medication. This is all part of an effort to do something about the opioid crisis that is damaging us here in Tennessee and really the entire country. Tomorrow in the legislature, two people will testify on behalf of this proposal. They are with us tonight. Happy to have with us Dr. Sterling Herring uh, from Vanderbilt. Thank you, doctor, for being with us. Thank you. And uh, Liz Beatty, right? That's right. Um, thank you for being with us. You're going to be testifying tomorrow. You have a personal story to tell, and I appreciate it. Um, I guess we're going to talk about what the proposal is. I want to first ask kind of what brought you to this point, to be willing to come on TV, to go talk to the legislature. Doctor, I'll start with you. Kind of what's at stake as far as you're concerned? Everything is at stake, and I, I hate to kind of try to oversell this, but it's that's really where we are with this crisis. So my background, prior to medical school, prior to getting anywhere near now, I was working in mental health and substance abuse. I worked in substance abuse for young people, teenagers, uh, out on, near the West Coast, and then I worked in uh, mental health and substance abuse in Florida when the opioid crisis was just starting to come onto our radar in the in the 2000s. And I saw um, I saw the number of our patients go from you know, one or two hundred to four hundred to six hundred to eight hundred, and it was very concerning that something was going on. So fast forward, I went to grad school, as I may have mentioned, at, at Johns Hopkins University. I did a master's degree, and I'm finishing a doctorate degree there now in injury policy, and this has just been more and more on my radar. I worked with CDC on state policies surrounding opioids in four or five different states. Um, and now here we are in Tennessee dealing with this, this issue on a very on a very real basis every day. So we are, we're seeing what some of the numbers, I think we hear the numbers and we don't fully comprehend them, but the numbers are pretty astounding. They are. We lose an average of five people a day in Tennessee to opioid overdose. It's five people every day. We're losing more people to that than car wrecks. Now, we are. Right? We are. So that's where you're coming from. Liz, where What's your background, your perspective? Uh, my journey to today started on June the 11th, 2016. It was a normal Saturday morning. My 24-year-old son, Alex, uh, spent the night. He was a senior at MTSU studying film and video um, photography. And he came home to, to do some work. And it got to be 9 o'clock in the morning. And Alex was not normally a late sleeper. I could hear his dog upstairs scratching on the door. I went up the stairs, knocked on the door, yelled to him, didn't answer, opened it. He had ESPN Sports Center on, the light next to the bed. The dog had jumped back up. And I kept yelling, and he didn't answer. And I knew at that point something was wrong. And I got closer, and I saw the... Uh, the cone of foam and blood coming out of his mouth, blue, and I immediately yelled down to my husband to call 911. In the meantime, I tried to start CPR, thinking that if I can just get the EMTs there, who literally are across the street from us, that we could save him. But I immediately knew he was dead. But I kept on, and the 911 operator kept walking me through doing this until the EMTs arrived. And from then, um, our house was a crime scene, and Instead of making graduation plans, we were planning a funeral, we were writing an obituary, we were dealing with the worst nightmare. Alex, for 10 years, had suffered from addiction. And we found out his freshman year in high school when we got a call from the nurse that they were rushing him to the hospital and we learned then he had a .19 alcohol level. And I had dropped him off at school that morning and he drank a 12 ounce bottle, filled, a water bottle filled with vodka. And from there, for the next uh, eight and a half years, we were in and out of treatment uh, for alcohol and marijuana. And as long as it was that, he could have times where he could graduate from college, uh, he graduated from Columbia State, transferred to MTSU. But he, as soon as he hit that campus and he discovered the availability of prescription drugs, um, Xanax was the worst for him. And we saw from there he could not come back from that. And so in a very short time, about a 15 month period of time, he down spiraled. And he, the week that he died, he threw away alcohol, threw away drugs, but he needed to sleep. And so he researched how much do you pay for Oxycontin, 
30 and he purchased probably about 12 or 13 tablets and some Xanax and the combination of those two he went to sleep and he never woke up. Good grief. So it was it was Oxycontin and Xanax. The the number one it's one of the top combinations that will kill and you do, you go to sleep and your brain forgets to tell your lungs to breathe. And what we're talking about there again is these are prescription drugs, right? I Correct. mean these are not the the things that you, you, they're prescribed. They're they're legal, yes. and yet they're doing this damage. And part of what you want to do is what you you want this bill. We're going to talk about this bill, but also you want people to feel more free to talk about this. Is Absolutely. that right? Absolutely. From that moment on, my husband and I, my husband Yarnell and I made a decision that we were not going to go quietly. We could have easily we fought it for ten years, and we said no. Alex's life mattered and we need to tell his story and we need to make sure we make the comfort level for others to tell the story. So I started a movement called Breaking the Silence and over the last uh, couple of years I have helped set up with churches to bring in practitioners, to bring in youth, parents, preachers, get people talking and you would be surprised the number of people that that reach out and I get probably on a monthly basis people that will ask me where do I go for help and so now I can't bring Alex back, but I can breathe life into other people and give them hope. Fascinating. Well, thank you for sharing that. I want to talk more about that, but let's now, as we set the table here, and then I want people to call in, what is this bill? You're both going to be testifying tomorrow. We're talking about, I guess, changing the way we package these, these pain pills, some of these prescription pills. What, what, is, what are we talking about here? Well, I think it's becoming more and more clear that there's no one silver bullet, so to speak, that's going to solve this problem. Uh, even today, FDA released or, or announced that they're going to be taking a number of approaches in 2019 to combat this, one of which will be addressing packaging issues. So we talk about uh, issues that were facing us in the 1960s, 1970s, or early 1960s, I should say, about children taking um, Tylenol or, or Advil like it was candy, and so that's when they implemented childproof caps. And it was specifically aimed at that small groups, or small children groups, right? Two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and they were very effective. The number of people who, the y number of young children who died from those overdoses dropped by over 50% after that bill was introduced. So I didn't know that. So that's why we have these the, the tops that we have now, yes. where you have to kind of press or do whatever it is. That happened because of kids just taking these pills and right. killing them. Okay. Right, that's exactly. So that was in the 70s or so? 1970 was when that bill passed. Okay. And then so they added to that, after the Tylenol scare with the poisoning, then we're going to add additional packaging. So we're going to put it, not only the cap, we're going to put a seal around it, we're going to put a box, we're going to try right. and put as many barriers between somebody that does not need to be in that, that bottle. And even in the mid-2000s, when you think about uh, infant dosing, where, where ibuprofen was 5 milliliters per 106, what, you know what I mean? All these crazy numbers, and they, they made those universal so to try to, again, prevent small children from dying from these things. And here we are in 2019 with a completely different type of problem. We have not three-year-olds and four-year-olds accidentally taking medications. We have teenagers purposefully taking medications that they just may not know how potent and how dangerous they are. So instead of continuing to package the deadliest medication that our country has ever known in Tylenol bottles, we should be doing something else about it. So what this bill does is doesn't mandate anything, it changes the default packaging for prescription for dangerous prescription medications, specifically opioids, uh, certain types of stimulants, benzodiazepines like Xanax that she was referring to earlier, and it puts them in lockable bottles that will help keep uh, people who to whom these medications were not prescribed out of them. And if, it, if they cannot keep them out of them, at least make it clear that someone else has gotten into it. The process, the, the, it's, it's called pilfering. It's, it's, we found that over 50% of teens uh, started or had their initial opioid exposure from the supply of someone, of a family member or a friend who was prescribed that opioid. And often they took it, you're twice as likely to get it from, take it from a, a medicine cabinet without asking than you are to get it from a drug dealer. So we can't plug all the holes, but some of them we can, and this is a big one. So what this bill says is instead of just releasing these into the wild in cheap plastic bottles like we put our vitamins in, let's put them in something that locks, something that comes with a key. This one was made here in Tennessee, and this is one of the options that you have to have the key to open the bottle. It's not hard, anyone can do it. And it's not mandatory. 
you can opt out of it. Anyone can opt out of it. It's just a new default. And I see what you have there. There's, there's, is that a combination? Is there one where there's actually a combination? Yeah, there, there are a few different options. And there are some that use biometrics, like your fingerprint or that sort of thing. The ones that I have here are this one, as I mentioned, has a key. And then we have a couple with a combination lock. This one, you put in, the, you twist this. You can set the combination when you pick up your medication. So you set it to a four-digit number that you're going to remember. And then the top just pops off. This is a similar model with a combination lock on the top. So we post about this, and then on Twitter you get all kinds of comments. There's somebody who, who said, well, you can still use a hammer. Um, and I think, well, I'll let you respond to that. But what, what is your response? It, it's not going to stop everything, right. right? But you have identified some areas for improvement where a lot of these are getting out into the, into the public. Is that right? Yes, yes. I have, my colleagues have, and honestly, experts across the country have. Uh, I worked on this report that's the original, this is a copy of it, the original is something like 40 or 50 pages long and together with a number of experts from across the country we put together the most evidence-based approaches to the opioid epidemic addressing it on the national level, state level, the community level and this was one of our, this is one of our intended approaches. People do come and they say hey you know it looks like I could get that open if I had a big enough chainsaw. That's not the purpose of these bottles. The bottle, the purpose of these bottles is to allow someone who is meant to have it to use it easily, and someone who is not meant to have it to have to work to get into it, and it be clear that someone else got into it. I buy, I buy. Yeah, you could use a hammer. You could, you could break it. I buy that. I buy also that a lot of kids are using these things for the first time because their parents, I guess, got a prescription, or their grandparents, or whatever. Somebody goes, has surgery, gets a prescription, and that's maybe a whole other thing. How many of these things are given out and all of that? But there's, there's some left over, and then I get that some kid would then go and open that up and and take one for the first time and you're saying that's happening and that's a gateway that's the way a lot of these people are being introduced to this drug that's that exactly right? right how could this have helped could it have helped your son well first of all the drugs that he bought on the street the oxycontin and the xanax had to come from somebody these were legitimate pills these were not the ones that you hear about being made in the pill mills and being um, actually fentanyl these were actual pills and so they had to come from somewhere and most likely it's not the person that he bought them from very likely they took them from somebody else's um, i believe when you pick up a prescription, you are counseled by the pharmacist as to how dangerous these are. I believe our gen the generation under 40 has grown up with TV ads being filled with prescription drugs. I believe that began in 1983. So they legitimized that these pills are are safe. Uh, they see them, like as you said, being prescribed by real doctors, sold at their corner, you know, CVS or Walgreens. And my son, he seemed to rationalize, it's not cocaine, it's not heroin, it's not meth, I can pop a few here, just like an Advil or a Tylenol. I, I'm a big boy, I can, I lived through this and I'm, I'm safe. I think if he early on would have appreciated that these are the same thing as if you're handing somebody a gun. You expect them to put a safety on it. You don't expect them to leave it in their cars. You don't expect them to leave it where children can get it. Opioids are equally deadly. And I think the mindset would have been changed. All right, we have to take a break. Uh, that kind of sets the table for the discussion. If you'd like to call in, there's the number, 615-737-PLUS, 615-737-7587. What are your thoughts? Uh, if you're on the line, hold on. Uh, we'll take your call. We'll be back right after this.